Bibles to the book of Matthew, so we're in the sixth chapter. For uh, I guess close to, a, I don't know, maybe we're getting close to a year that we've been in the dispensation. Uh, we're now in the dispensation of grace. Uh, at this time, grace has not come. Jesus is the love of God. He is the mercy of God. And he's revealing God to the people for the first time. He had chosen disciples. And now after when they had gone to Jerusalem, he took them out to the Mount of Olives. And he began to teach them. The things that he was going to teach them, they had not found in the law. But in the law, he was going to take and uh, he not add more, but he was going to take it from the outward appearance and put it inwardly. Now, uh, ever since the world began, God had only been on the outside of man. But now, in grace, after he goes to the cross and after he gives his life, sheds his blood, buried, resurrected, ascended into heaven, then comes the day of Pentecost, which he hadn't got to here yet, then God was going to take residence inside of man. No longer would everybody go as a Jewish nation to Jerusalem, to the temple, to worship God, because God not only was going to be with us, but God was going to be in us. So at this time, the things that he was teaching them, I promise you, they did not understand. The things that he was teaching them is, first of all, we're going to uh, back to the fifth chapter of the 17th verse. This is the key to all the Beatitudes that, uh, that he's teaching, all the, the truths of it. Fifth chapter, 17th verse. And his teaching, when he opened up on the, uh, the mount, he said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law. Now the law is not only the Ten Commandments, but when you're talking about the law, there are 614 commandments. God gave Moses the writings on the tablets on the mountain, Ten Commandments, but when Moses came off of the mountain, then God gave him the rest of the commandments, which adds up to 614 commandments. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law, but this is what he came for. Not destroy the law or the prophets. I am come, uh, I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Now this is the key about grace. What the law demanded. The law demanded a sacrifice. A sacrifice of blood. A sacrifice of a lamb. Without spot and without blemish. In order to be saved under the law, nobody could be. Because you had to keep all the commandments. All 614 commandments. Every day. As long as you lived, if you broke one commandment, then it was null and void. The law is like a chain. I watched Miss Joyce backed in there. Miss Joyce backed over the uh, asphalt of the night, put her wheels up on the snow, and it wouldn't go. That made a rhyme, didn't it? Put her wheels up on the snow and it wouldn't go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a poet and don't know it. And so several of the men, I think, Tommy, did they finally hook you up? Yeah. They yeah. finally got Tommy hooked up and they pulled her out. But what would happen to Miss Joyce if the chain broke and a link was gone? She'd still be sitting on ice. That's what the law is. The law could only do something if it was never broken. But when you broke one, you was guilty of it all. It had no power. So all these people that you hear going about saying, well, I live by the Ten Commandments, they are lying. That's right. They might try to live, but they're going to come up short. But there are more commandments than the Ten Commandments. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy it, I did not come to, when he came and after Calvary and after his ascension, after Pentecost, he said, thou shalt not kill is still true. Amen. Right. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's right. still true. 
But what he did was the, the traditional things, the sacrificial things. I've not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, from this point, fast forward. When he got on the cross at Calvary and gave his life and shed his blood, then he fulfilled what the law demanded. Amen. He was the perfect sacrifice. He was a man giving his life for man. It no longer was an animal giving his life for men, but it was God in the flesh giving his life for man. So he fulfilled what the law required. Now he sits down and he begins to teach the boys. The first thing that he taught them uh, was, he says, you are the salt of the earth. And I said this all many times when we've been coming through this. You can imagine these little Jew boys. He's now going to teach them something that they had never heard. But the reason Jesus was doing this, because when the Holy Spirit would come on the day of Pentecost and the birth of the church, he said it like this. When the Comforter is come, what's he going to do? He's going to remembrance. bring all things to remembrance. So the things that he's teaching now, after he's gone and the church is born and the Spirit of God lives in, they'll be going along and then they'll recall what Jesus said. They'll remember. It's like you and I. We read the Word of God. We think that we know it. But boy, when we think we know it, there's something that will pop into us that we didn't even know we knew. You know what that is? That's the Spirit of God revealing the Word to us. He's a teacher. He's a comforter. He's a guide. So think not that I've come to destroy, but to fulfill. He told them, he said, you are the salt of the earth. He said a salt is a preserver. If the salt has lost its savor, then it's no good. So... <laughs> Do you know why the world is going on right now? It's because we're here. Right. Do you know why the devil can't have free reign? It's because we're here. Right. Do you know why he hasn't unleashed his power like he can? Because we're here. But when he takes the salt out, when he raptures us out, the devil's going to have him a heyday. All hell is going to break loose on this earth. So he's taught them about murder. He taught them about adultery. I like this part. Uh, people try to talk about how good they are. And every man and woman, I would, you might not admit it, but are, they're guilty of this one thing. Thou shalt not commit adultery, Jesus said. Said you've read it, said it's written, thou shalt not commit adultery. I've heard people tell me, I have never committed adultery. I have been faithful my entire life. If you've got hormones, <laughs> right. Jesus said, if a man looketh upon a woman or a woman upon a man with lust in his heart, he's committed adultery with her already. Now I can imagine these little Jew boys saying, what are you talking about? What Jesus was saying, hey, you got to keep yourself under control. You've got to let your eyes look at things that will glorify me and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So now he's taking things outward from rules and regulations written down on paper and he's telling them when the church comes and the spirit comes, I'm going to get in you and I'm going to bring all these things that I've been teaching you to remembrance and you are going to be powerful because I will be in you. So he taught them about murder. He taught them about adultery. He taught them about divorce. He even taught them about taking oaths. I swear by the hair on my head, that's true. And I've told you this. If somebody has got to raise their right hand and say, I swear I'm telling the truth, they're lying. 
The truth's the truth. If they won't believe you when you just tell them, you no need to you raising your hand saying, I swear. That's not a good place to hop. Amen. <laughs> That's true. So Jesus was, was bringing forth what was going to live inside. He said, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye. But I say unto you, if somebody slaps you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. And I told you this, I can imagine Peter, when he heard that one thing, it infuriated him. Peter was a fighter. He wasn't a lover. He was a fighter. In fact, he wanted to whip everybody that came along. He wanted to protect Jesus from any and everything that came his way. And he was willing to fight for it. But Jesus said, I'm going to show you a new way. I'm going to show you a living way. I'm going to show you a way that you could have never thought of before. He said, love your enemies. You find that hard? Yeah. 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 I do. But I know that I'm supposed to. I know that I've got to go past my flesh. Jesus said, love your enemies. Then he taught them, give to the needy. Uh, let me say, our <coughs> people have been great about this one time. There have been thousands of dollars since I've been here given to people in our community and nobody ever says anything. When our, our council meets and there's a problem or somebody needs something, we make a decision and give money to them and nobody ever says a thing. And that's great. I am so proud of that. Jesus said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Don't brag if you give. Don't, if you do something for somebody, keep your mouth shut and make sure that nobody finds it out. And I'll tell you what I like to do. I've done this ever since I've been saved. If I see somebody that has a need in their life, a financial need, I'll never let anybody know it. I'll take an envelope, I'll put something in it, and I'll put it in their mailbox under their floor mat in their car seat and just go. You ever tried that? Man, that's a blessing. That is a blessing. God gives to you and to me so that we can meet other people's needs. Right. So if I've been blessed, and if I'm blessed and have it, I want to share it. I, it's very hard for me. I'm not a taker. I'm not a taker. I'm a giver. It's very hard if somebody says, do you need that? If I, I lie like a dog. <laughs> no, I don't. No, I don't, I don't need that. All the time I'm saying, what's wrong with you? You do need that. No, I don't need that. But if I see somebody has a need, and I feel that's a good thing, a good thing to have. Uh, my grandmother said to me, and I was a little boy, and it's true. She said, God will never give you any more than he trusts you with. That's right. I thought at times, boy, he couldn't trust me very far. <laughs> you ever feel like that? Yeah. So he's talked about helping and giving to the needy. Now we're down to where we've covered all that in the prior weeks. So we're now down to the 38th verse in the 6th chapter of the the fifth verse, excuse me, the fifth verse, uh, he was talking about giving. Now he's going to talk about praying. Fifth verse, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. Now I want to stop and ask you, what's a hypocrite? I've heard people say, I'm not going to church because it's full of hypocrites. <coughs> what's a hypocrite? Someone says one thing and does another all right, but what's a hypocrite? Somebody else. Claiming to be somebody they're not. Say it loud. Claiming to be someone they're not. Okay, give me another. What's a hypocrite? Here's a good word. Don't ever forget it. Pretender. Yeah. They never was. <coughs> they never have been. They're just pretending to be. That's all. So let me say this to you. Every person that is a hypocrite in Ballard County 
Bless God, I would love them to come to church here. I would love to be associated with them. I would love for them to sit on the front pew. I would love for them to sit behind me. Why? Because I don't want them to be pretenders. I want them to have the real thing. Amen. Amen. So he said, don't be like the <coughs> hypocrites. Because these cats are pretending. They don't possess. They're not the real thing. They are pretenders. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be like the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now think of this. When Jesus was here, the apostles or the disciples of him that he, they had chosen, they had seen this for themselves. People that were so religious, they would go to the street corners. Now if you imagine me going down here at Kelly, might have to go somewhere else, there would be a big crowd. Go to Paducah to the mall. Get on the corner there, lift my hands up, and go to praying. To be seen of men. And everybody would pass by would say, Boy, that guy must be saved. They call the guys in a white coat and have him arrested, wouldn't they? But not in the days of Jesus. Not in the days of Christ. That was the thing. They would dress themselves and they would stand and they would pray. They would go to the synagogues and they would pray and they would just go on and on and on. Jesus said, that's not your prayer life. That's not a way that a man's supposed to pray. In the sixth verse, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into the closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and the Father which seeth thee in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen, I like that word, as the heathen do. For they think that they should be heard for their much speaking. How do we pray? Now if we're not careful, and I, I, I've noticed this all the years that I've been in church, we will pick up things when we hear other people pray. Let me give you an example. The smartest people we have on TV and news today, they have a word and it's gone on, a, a sentence and it's gone over to Hollywood. About three or four months ago, there's a colonel that was on Fox News. Bill O'Reilly was uh, interviewing him. And this is a statement that he made. And by the way, have y'all heard that? Watch the news. Watch any talk show. Listen to they'll, they'll all invariably say it. They'll be talking along and they'll say, and by the way, now I have this thing about it. Uh, if somebody says a word more than three times, I go to count. <laughs> I, I do. If they say, and uh, and uh, and uh, I say one, and two, three, four. Poor old Barbara, she has sit, and then I go to blowing. I don't know I'm doing it. She'll quit blowing. Twelve, thirteen. I don't. I quit listening. I quit listening. Don't hear nothing else. Now in prayer, we listen in church. Everybody will pick up what somebody else says and include that because they want to learn how to pray properly. You know what a proper prayer is? Thank you, Lord. If that's all you can say and amen, that's, a, that's sufficient. 
Praise your blessed name, Lord. Amen. That's sufficient. That's all you can say? Leave it alone. They told me at church after I got saved, the pastor said, now you get ready because we're going to call on you to pray. You know what I did? I went to write me out one. I went to rehearsing that lady because I didn't want to be embarrassed and when they called my name, I was going to be ready and hit it. And they called on me. I went blank. I mean, it just everything I had put down, it just left me. <coughs> This was my prayer. Oh, God, help me. That's all I could do. So then he said, don't use vain words. Oh, Lord, I thank thee that I've been able to come to your house today. Oh, God, just to give you glory and honor and praise. Thank you, Lord, for the beautiful flower. Oh, God, thank you for the trees and the wind and the, the ocean and the seas and the lakes. Oh, God, praise your blessed name. Now, if I was back there in the days that Jesus, I'd be standing on the street corner and that's how I'd be praying. And people would pass by and they'd say, man, that guy really has a relationship with God. That's what he's called a hypocrite. It's got to be inward, the really deep down rooted thing within you that you're calling out to God for. Not what somebody else has said. So forget about rehearsing one. If I call on you to pray, you can't say nothing but that. Oh God, amen. That's good. God heard that as much as a 15 minute prayer. Right, amen. Right, right. I've been in prayer groups with preachers where they'd all get around and all of them going praying as loud as I could and I couldn't hear myself and didn't know what I was praying. <laughs> you may have never been in one of those prayer groups before. I, I just... And then I tried when I was with a bunch of preachers, I'd listen to all their prayers and then I knew I had to out-pray them. <laughs> you ever feel that way? This is what Christ is telling him. Hey, that won't get it. That's not what prayer is. Now I want to bring something else to mind. The people did not know how to pray. Who did the praying? The priest. What did the people know how to do? They knew how to recognize their sin and what offering they must bring to the priest for him to offer an atonement. What Jesus is teaching them, you're going to develop a prayer life. It's going to be a personal thing between you and God. So don't be like the heathen, the people that don't know God. Don't be like the hypocrites. Now, he comes now uh, to where that he's going to talk. They're, they're, they ask him, they want to know how to pray. This is the model prayer. This is not the prayer of Jesus. This is him showing them a pattern or something that they could follow. Eighth verse. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Now, there's something about the first few verses or first few words that is very important in our prayer lives. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father. Now, in your prayer life, you have a father. You don't call on Jesus. You call on God. Our father. So that's an entrance into, the, into heaven. That is an entrance because we've been born again. Jesus shed his blood. But the father forgave us of our sins and birthed us into the kingdom of God. 
because of what his son did. That's our entrance into God. But we have a father which art in heaven. So that tells us where God is. Right. Now I'm going to pull up the part right there a minute. Our Father, which art in heaven. Now was God going to always be in heaven? Or was it going to change? God will always be in heaven, but God will also be in us by the Holy Spirit. So our Father, which art in heaven. Now here's, we called on God, we recognize where He is, but then comes the important thing. Hallowed would be thy name. Do you know what He's saying? Praise. Worship. Holy is God. Holy is your name. I praise your name, God. We should never come to God and just say, Oh God, my big toe's hurting. Heal my big toe right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. The first thing we need to do is recognize and acknowledge who God is. He is our Father. He is in heaven and praise His name because His name is above every name. He is the Alpha, the Omega. He is the beginning. He is the end. So holy is your name. You are in heaven. Second thing, He says, Thy kingdom come. At this time, the church was not born. What kingdom is he talking about? Thy kingdom come. When is the kingdom of God going to be come? How about the thousand years millennial reign? Thy kingdom come. Come and set up your earthly reign. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now in heaven, everything is done to perfection. There are no fusses, there are no fights, there are no arguments, there are no falling outs in heaven. So he says, pray to your heavenly Father, praise Him, that the kingdom will come and that His will would be done in earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> Remember what we were preaching this morning? Every child of God ought to be on their knees or in a prayer attitude of praying and praying and praying that God would strengthen His church, His people, and then turn our prayers to our president and our congressmen and our senators and our leaders and men of authority and pray that, that their hearts would be broken and that they would get saved. Amen. I didn't touch this this morning, but I will, I will now. If there's one question I could ask President Obama, I would ask him this. Are you a born-again Christian? Our news media don't have the guts. Yeah. I might spend the rest of my time in jail with tax evasion. Because it's the same time. <laughs> but I'd ask him one time. And then it would take every question out of it. And if he's a true Muslim, he'll have to deny it. You think on that. Now, these things that he ha we we've talked about, his will, praise him, Father, heaven, then it comes down, we do all these things before we get to the 11th verse, and what's the first word of the 11th verse? Yeah, yeah. Give. We get it out of text, don't we? We start out, God give, God give, God give, God help, God help. Jesus put it down where it need to be. 
When we learn to come and acknowledge God, who God is, we learn to uh, praise His name. We learn to put it in the right perspective. Then we can come down to the place. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In Christ Jesus, there is forgiveness. When He comes to live in our lives, we've got to learn to forgive. Right. Every one of us wants to be forgiven. But have you found it hard to forgive people? Yeah. Amen. Amen, Crow. That's something you've got to work at. I mean, you, there's been things that Miss Barbara has said to me that I've held. <laughs> How about you? Amen. And there's a lot I've said she's had. And every once in a while it'll come out. And then we'll deal with it. You don't have to carry that load. You don't have to carry that burden. So learn to forgive. It's very important. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, the next two verses is legalism. I never could explain these two verses away. But I want to show them to you. For if ye forgive men that trespass against, or if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your your Father forgive your trespasses. Now somebody explain that to you. When you sin and you tell that person that they sin and then your sin will not be recognized unless you forgive yourself of them. Okay. Does that literally mean what it says? If you don't forgive men their trespasses, your father's not going to forgive you your trespasses. All right. Now listen to me. I come to get saved. And I've got me a grudge against somebody. And I will not forgive them. And I come to God and ask Him to forgive me of my sins. Will He? Don't get locked jaw on me now. <laughs> Will He? According to that verse, those two verses, He's not going to let me come into the kingdom. He's not going to save me. Now here's kicker. Now this is good. Or I wouldn't say it. <laughs> They're still under law. Grace hadn't gone to Calvary. Grace had not been buried. Grace had not resurrected. Grace had not descended from heaven and come to live in man. This is legalism. Now I'm going to show you why it's legalism. When Jesus died on Calvary and resurrected, how much did He pay for our sins and did He pay for all our sins? Yes. He paid for all of them. All right. If He paid for all our sins and He will never be crucified, there will never be another sacrifice then what do we have to do in order to be forgiven? Receive it. By grace are ye saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not a works lest any man should boast. But now, in these two verses, they're still under law. And he's telling them, don't ask me, don't ask my father 
to forgive you if you're not willing to forgive those that have trespassed against you. Clear as mud. That does not mean if you harbor or have something in your heart, a grudge or hatred in your heart, and you come to God, God will forgive you and save you. Promise you upon the authority of His Word. He will save you. If, if, if He wouldn't save you there, He would have said, when you come to me, you better make sure everything's right in your heart before I can forgive you. Jesus takes us just as we are. Right. With all our feelings, all our evil, He takes us just as we are. <coughs> then, when we get saved, He says, old things pass away, and behold, all things become new. And you look out through different eyes at that person you had a grudge against, and I'll tell you what, forgiveness will come in your heart and in your life. Right. If you've been saved, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Right. You'll, you'll love people you couldn't stand. You'll care for people that you didn't even want to be around. I've sat on the pew with some of the ugliest old fellows and put my arm around them and say, Glory to God, brother, I love you. And I would have never done that before. I promise you. Never done that before. But see, regeneration, being born again makes a difference. So he said, model your prayer when you pray. Our Father, acknowledge Him. Holy is your name. I praise you. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want your will. I want your way to be done. And then give us this day our daily bread. Uh, forgive us of our trespasses. We forgive those that trespass against us. So, we need to learn how to pray. Now, one more thing and then we'll, we'll quit. But I need to, to get this in. 16th verse. Don't lift your hands. But how many of you have ever fasted? I'm going to ask you this. How many of you have ever fasted? How many of you ever fasted and prayed? Okay. There are a lot of people that fast. There are a lot of sinners that fast. They want to lose weight so they quit eating. That's called a fast. <laughs> but Jesus said, that is an important thing. If you really want to get close to God, if there is really a need in your life, put off the food. Don't let anybody know it. Put off, quit eating. Now, that's very hard to do in 21st century America. If I don't eat when Barbara gets it fixed, she said, are you sick? What's wrong with you? Is it not any good? Does it not smell good to you? Don't you like what I fix? And I mean, it'll land up in a knockdown drag out. Here I am trying to get close to God, and I'm fast. <laughs> I'll do the same thing to her. Now, notice what the scripture says 16 verse, moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anointest thy head and wash thy face, and thou appearest not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and the Father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. All right, we're going to fast. The way the hypocrites were doing it, they would disfigure their faces. They wouldn't comb their hair. They would look pale. They'd look bent. And everybody would say, man, they're trying to get close to God. But the Lord said, when you do this, comb your hair. <laughs> That's what he's talking about, putting oil on your head. Comb your hair. Wash your face. Get cleaned up. If you ever made your appearance presentable, be presentable now. Don't allow anybody to know what's going on in your life. 
Don't let anybody even suspect that you're going without food, that you are standing before the Lord and that you're praying and you are making requests of God and you're going to do this until things get right. Close with this one statement. Y'all heard of Oral Roberts? Yeah. yeah. Younger ones won't know who I'm talking about. In Oklahoma, he, used, he started out as, as a Pentecostal preacher, a faith healer, tent ministry all across the, the world. And he is the founder of Oral Roberts University. Uh, and I'm not saying anything that people don't know. He built a prayer tower there. It's still there. And he would go in his tower of prayer and people would write their request and he would take and scatter them out and he would fast and pray. Well, the minister got in a little bit of trouble. So he put it out on TV for two or three weeks and he said, I'm going up into the prayer tower and I'm going to stay there and fast. And I forget how many million dollars he needed until God gives me so many million dollars. I'm telling you what, if I had God, he'd set up there and starve to death. <laughs> Why? Because of this. Because God does not want us to announce to the world that we're having a fast. God does not want us to announce to the world that we're doing without food and we are concentrating our lives and our prayer lives to God. We're getting God's attention and telling God, God, I need you worse than I need a bologna sandwich. Everybody said? Amen. That's what it's about. That's what he's trying to teach his disciples. Oh, Roberts never did get all that he wanted, and he finally come down. Listen, that mess wasn't a God to start with. How can I say that? I wouldn't say that against anybody, some would say. If God said it here, that sanctions it. We can say it. So if you're going to do a fast, don't tell anybody. And don't come in here paint. Paint yourself up and comb your hair. Wash your face. Look good. Don't let anybody know about it. We're going to close there. Uh, when we get through, we don't like much uh, being through uh, the Beatitudes. Uh, this finishing up 6 chapter, 7 chapter, and that will be up, all of that. And then we're going to hit something that is going to explain everything that we've been doing here. And then we're going to the life of Jesus and go to the cross and go to the crucifixion, the resurrection. And from there we're going to the Pentecost. And from there we'll start in a little bit of the church. And from there we're going to the book of Revelation and go through. We'll have a good time. Amen. Let's stand together.